Hello, this is Nick here from Gorgon Reviews, and I'm speaking with Johannes Grinsbergner, director of the film Rosin Nest. Rosin Nest, as a film, is a lot of things, and we will touch on that later. But it is premiering for the first time at Fantastic Fest this year as part of the Burt Inns part of the festival. Thank you so much for spending time here. I know you traveled to Austin for this event, and you have probably tons of things lined up. All so right. The, the cool thing is, so I'm, I'm here for, for, for the premiere, of course, of, of, of Rod's Nest, but I'm also here with some friends because Tim League uh, invited us. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are like one of the many things I'm doing is I'm running a cocktail robot festival in Austria. So for 25 years, it's kind of weird. We, we have been presenting weird contraptions and machines and robots that serve you alcohol or cocktails or mix you drinks. And Tim Leake really liked the idea so much that he said, like, hey, bring a couple of machines over. So uh, yesterday night we got shit-faced uh, with our own <laughs> machines and we tried to serve the general public of Fantastic Fest. And at the moment, they are down there quarreling with the bar about the logistics of how to get more booze. And there was a little bit of like a hiccup in the administration and logistics yesterday. And I'm glad I don't have to be part of this discussion. So <laughs> <laughs> that is that is fantastic. Um, and you said it's a little weird, but I mean, that was your idea. You've been doing this for 25 years because you wanted to, right? Yeah. Like yes. Was... Yes. Yeah. But I mean, the thing <laughs> is, like in, in, in Austria, we're working with the same venues, the same people here. We did it with oh, a completely yeah. new set of people in a bar. Most of the people just work here maybe one or two nights a week or something. And they, some of some people were not briefed about some of the things that we need. And but anyhow, it was all fine. It was great. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like we're not complaining. We're just smoothing out the system a little bit. <laughs> nice. Uh, one of the first things I like to do to get to know the director better is to ask them what's the first movie you remember seeing in theaters. The first movie that I remember seeing. Uh, it's a little bit blurry. I'm not sure. I think the first thing that I really saw was some kind of like weird Tom and Jerry, you know, like 10 minute thing. Mm. Uh, because I remember when I was a kid, they were they just opened up uh, a new theater in my, my little hometown. And they had this like kids afternoon and they were just screening like cartoons or something. So it was not really a film. It could also be uh that I mean, it, it, it might be that but honestly that doesn't really count <laughs> uh so so i think the first film that i really saw in a movie theater was uh, et in oh. 82 yes I, I was i was seven years old and uh that was quite a ride <laughs> and my grandmother was was with me and uh, she was completely overwhelmed. And I have to say, I'm from Austria. We always have to talk about the past, you know, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But my, my grandmother was never really kind of like super conservative or anything. But I really, it's a very distinct memory that my grandmother came out of E.T. And she couldn't really, she didn't really understand, I think, or couldn't sort what she saw. It was kind of overwhelming <laughs> for her. I completely got it. Uh, uh, but... The way why is my oh, I'm so sorry, I just have to check. Ah there. my plug was not plugged in, so I don't want to run out of power. Oh yeah. So <laughs> little little glitch in the system. So uh continuing with my grand grandmother's story. And so she didn't know how to contextualize that or what that was. It was just a weird film. And then she came out and she looked and she looked around and said, like, mm, yeah, yeah, Spielberg. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jewish, Jewish. <laughs> and, and, I, and she was never, you know, like a Nazi or anything like that. But she tried to grasp something. I thought, like, yeah, maybe that's something about Jewish culture or crazy. I, I don't know. I, 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 but I really remember that even with seven years old Johannes, I felt like, what does that have to do anything with anything, you know? <laughs> Anyhow, but it was it was E.T., yes. <laughs> Interestingly enough, a lot of people end up saying a Spielberg movie. It just yeah. depends on how old they are, whether it's Jaws, E.T., or Jurassic oh, Park. Oh, absolutely. Usually yeah, it's yeah. one of those. I mean, he, he, shaped, he shaped the way, yeah. like a whole generation experienced movies, and, and, uh, and, and not even only his own films. I mean, like all that, you know, like Indiana Jones, all the stuff that he produced. So, uh, I mean, Poltergeist is probably the second 
in in line of things that I remember seeing and having a deep impact because my my parents were barbecuing outside and it was like uh, 10 p.m. and I was sitting uh, in front of the TV on Aus Austrian TV and they played Poltergeist. I was like nine or something like that, and I remember I I think I probably I was never as scared at any point in my life than sitting there alone in the room and watching Poltergeist and the guy scraping his face off and and all that stuff and the tennis ball dropping through the ceiling and I could I could not I I think my nervous system was overwhelmed by fear or by what the fuck is this and so that that yeah and that's also Spielberg produced although a very uh, untypical yeah. Spielberg um within the interview I looked into what people have done in the past and uh you've just done so many things so far um you have a lot of passion ideas you like to get those ideas out there to the public from the conferences you've set up like the the cocktail one uh to the to the zines the cheetos and bad dragon um but <laughs> do you ever for, for, for the people who know what it is they were just like ah bad dragon yeah uh i won't go further into that um, do you ever feel limited by the fabrics of reality, though? Oh, I mean, the thing is, uh, of course, with any... Uh, by the way, can you hear the music from the projection booth next door? There is, like, some really, like, like nice cannot. ambience here. You cannot. No. Oh, it's, that's, too, that's too bad, because there's some really, like... Dum, 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 it's going on, 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 this, on the bass level. It, it doesn't matter. So, okay... Uh, the story is that, of course, when you do something creative, or it, it hardly ever works that you have an idea in your mind and you actually can extract that idea out of yourself. It, it just doesn't work. So, uh, I mean, there are a couple of projects I did where I thought, like, I'm very close to how I really wanted it to be or how I envisioned it. But, of course, it doesn't work. I mean, your own imagination is just limited by the reality of actually making that stuff. So that's that that's hard. So I think like I'm I'm probably constantly hindered in some way by reality. And it's just like the physicality of like, yeah, it's just like not possible to project that stuff from my brain on a wall. And uh and even if that would be possible, the algorithm that would do it would probably fuck it up, you know. <laughs> um Rosin Nest is your second film premiering at Fantastic Fest. Last mm -hmm. year, you had Make uh, Masking Threshold. Oh yes, yeah. How, how would you describe that shortly for people who don't know what that movie is about? Okay, so Masking Threshold, uh, 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 folks will be able to see, uh, to see it very soon because the, the theatrical release at the Alamo Draft House Ooh. theaters will be on the thirtieth of September. And on the 7th of October, uh, it, it will have a streaming release because uh, Draft House Films bought the film, which honestly, I cannot believe. Uh, I, I'm now a colleague of uh, like Oppenheimer who did like the act of killing. Mm -hmm. And he, he's I'm, I'm being distributed by the same company as the act of killing. I can't, I can't believe that. So, uh, so the fun part was I did not expect to be even... Uh, accepted to fantastic fest last year and uh secondly uh, that was still when the travel ban from europe was still in place so i i couldn't believe that i actually made it into the us to be at the physical world premiere because i i talked to the consulate uh, the us consulate for like two hours and then they finally said okay we'll let you go and uh so so masking threshold is uh, a very strange film. I mean, Rod's Nest is also a very strange film, but it's different. It could be, they're almost like siblings from, from a different mother or something like that, or like a different, ah, whatever it is. But, but uh, Masking Threshold is very straightforward. It's, uh, it's a guy who goes insane uh, because he's trying to cure his tinnitus. He has a ringing in his ears and he's a very uh, nerdy, uh, you know, like skeptic, person like a, a, a kind of like a one of these like reddit atheists you know and uh he's so obsessed with his worldview and and he he just thinks that he can beat the thing on his own so he's not trusting uh the the doctors he he calls them names and uh, he's starting to do experiments 
to find out what's what's wrong with himself and why his tinnitus is changing when he touches objects or or uh, meets people and yeah anyhow he starts experimenting and it doesn't end well for him and other people <laughs> and beings so that that's the story without the spoiler and uh, yeah and, and although i mean it's it's almost like a like a lovecraft story you kind of know from the very beginning it doesn't end well you know it's uh, the, the the question is like how is it presented and how well it is done <laughs> that, that it doesn't end well yeah <laughs> um so we got rosin nest this year and it is a very unique film um a different film critic friend of mine who was who watched it right before me he was like oh i think i got the wrong screener um, for obvious reasons, because he didn't, I mean, went in blind, right? Um, and then he just said, you'll see, you'll see. Um, because for, I guess the general plot of the movie is that Rosinus is a very visual film, um, but it starts really early on. There is a director's commentary that, I don't know, within the first minute, right? Um, yeah. But it's all fictional. That is the movie, the director's commentary. Yes. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. And all the characters are fictional in there. So where did you come up with an idea like this? I don't know. I mean, it's it's, it's so hard. Uh, I mean, many elements in the film have been around my mind for a long time. And for example, I always wanted to do a film about the 30 years war, uh, which is like a completely unknown war. I mean, I learned about it in school, but I quickly forgot it. The only thing that people sometimes remember is that it's the film that got started uh, film, what I'm saying, that the, the war that started because some guy was kicked out of a window in Prague. The, the defenestration of Prague. I don't know, it's just a weird way to, to start a war. And uh, But it shaped Europe. I mean, so many people died. There's some people who say that the, uh, the 30 years war, like statistically speaking, of how many people lived in Europe back then, more people died than in the Second World War. And it was an incredibly bloody war. And I always wanted to do something about that. But you can only do that usually if you have millions of dollars of budget. Because you like to do like a historical drama or something like that. And I wanted to do something about that. Also because the region where I grew up, where I actually filmed Rod's Nest, uh, is uh, there's a lot of dead stuff around. You see like statues or things or you, you you read local legends and and they talk about it so there is an impact of that thing of that war still like 300 400 years later and i want to do something with that and i also have a tendency to make fun about art house movies so i mean uh to a certain degree you could even say that Rod's Nest itself is an art house movie, or even Masking Threshold is an art house movie. But there's a specific kind of art house movie that sometimes I have the feeling of like, oh my, what, what is this? <laughs> and uh, so, so it's almost like an homage to art house films, but also ripping it apart. And it's also an homage to to genre films, and also kind of like ripping it apart or the scene uh, uh, around it. And uh, so I think all these components just like came together and uh, what really happened and I don't know where that came from is I was really in the shower in January of this year and in the shower and the shower was somewhat cold or something so I, I spent more time in the shower than usual and because the water didn't heat up or something I don't know and at, at some point I had this idea of like hey why not put like an audio play and a movie on top of each other. I don't know, like some somewhat, yeah. Uh, and what? And oh my god, it could be an audio commentary track. And the actual story is in the audio commentary track and not in the film. But then you would need something that is not visually too distracting from the audio plot, but it also has to have something that is coherent and keeps it together and is still great to look at and at some point might even start corresponding or 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 that there is a relationship between the audio commentary track and and or, or the story that goes on in the audio commentary track and and the visual layer and i think at that point i thought i, I sat down made a couple of notes and i started writing the next day and that was really on the 31st of january and the film was done in the beginning of June, 
So it was an incredibly fast process. I was so excited about it. I immediately started calling people. And for example, the reason why the main guy is from South Africa is because I know a friend of mine in, in Vienna who is from South Africa, and he usually doesn't use his South African accent. He, he can't, he's, he's super good in accents. He can do American accents and South African accents and, and all of it. And I thought, hey, I always wanted to do like a film with that guy. And maybe the director, like the fictitious director, is from South Africa. Then, and he's good at, 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 at like, and all the puzzle pieces fell into place and, and suddenly the thing was done <laughs> and I'm talking to you about it you know? yeah. um, the director from that movie um, that you mentioned uh, Manus Oosthuizen I, yeah. I, something it's like never that. clear if anyone <laughs> actually pronounces his name correctly yeah, yeah. Um, my first assumption when watching it I was like oh that must be the actual director also just doing the voice of this character that made me intimidated to even request an interview. And then I found out it was someone else. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> was he actually faced? I, I, I'm so, I'm, it is so great to talk to you about that because uh, I, it, I, I really, I honestly can't believe that people were really thinking that that, <laughs> like, for me, when I wrote it, at some point I thought like, maybe the satire, maybe, maybe the, the quirkiness and, 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 and Almost like assholishness of the character might even be too much <laughs> or something. Uh, but it, it, I, I really like the story that you told me about your colleague yeah. who thought it's a real audio commentary track. And, and I, 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 I thank you. This well, is a really huge compliment that someone would fall for it at least for a second. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. You're just like, wait, what's happening? It's not like immediately there's a joke right with the first word or anything. It takes a minute because of silly names and stuff to actually start coming together. Yeah. Um, that director Absolutely. wasn't probably based on anyone in particular then, just someone you created well, for a I friend. Mean, I, I put a couple of, I mean, I would say it's almost like taking like Werner Herzog and Klaus Kinski and putting them together in one character or something like that. Mm. <laughs> so because he is this like, he has the pretentiousness and I'm not, I, I really like Werner Herzog, I have to say. Uh, so I, 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 I'm a big fan. So, so I, I didn't like it, it's not a satire of Werner Herzog or something like that. But I think I think that the character has like different elements of of uh, art house uh, um, directors or people from the art house scene, and I, I, I try to mix and match them so so it forms like a, co a coherent character like like that douchebag. <laughs> Um, this is probably the first movie I watched that actually mentions fantastic film by name at some point in the movie. And there's one scene where the director is very specific about going to watch, uh, premiere his film, you know, during Fantastic Fest at the Alamo Draft House and eat buffalo cauliflower chicken, um, <laughs> of which I had to talk to my wife about later because it's literally her favorite thing on the menu. Whenever I would go, I'd have to bring some home. Yeah. And I, I had to ask, was that your food of choice at the Alamo? That's yes, why you got yes. a shout out. <laughs> yes, I, I, yeah, I, I thought like if it's a film that has a lot of you know like references in there, you know, like a lot of lot, lot of side. I mean, some of the jokes some people won't even understand as jokes because it's mm -hmm. an inside thing that only a couple of people might understand. But I like doing stuff like that. I mean, with Massive Threshold, I also put a lot of stuff in there that almost like nuggets in there. They're they not super relevant for the story, but it's it's, it's good to, to put it in there. I like that. that that's my nerdiness. Mm -hmm. And, oh yeah, yeah. I, I fell in love with the, uh, the, the buffalo cauliflower uh, last year. And I thought like, no, no, I, I want to put the buffalo cauliflower in there. And it's, it's kind of, it's sad, but also not because honestly, I did not expect that my film would be accepted at Fantastic Fest, like that I would have like two films in a row at Fantastic Fest. I, I did not expect that. I thought like, I enjoyed my time there. I liked, I liked the people. I liked Anik and, and Lisa who runs the festival. So I thought like, just, just for that, I want to give a shout out to the Alamo and, 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 and the folks there. And, uh, and when they accepted it, uh, I was, oh my God, uh, wow, will it actually really be in the theater at the Alamo Draft House with that joke? And then they told me, no, it will be, you will have world premiere, but it will be in the burnt ends segment, which is mm -hmm. only the virtual, only. There's yeah. no only. I, I, I'm, I'm super excited. So it's in the in the burnt ends yeah. uh, uh, selection. So uh, I, I don't 
uh, it, it was not prophecy that I put it in there because it's not screening on the big screen, at least not now, uh, but only on on the virtual screen. But but anyways, I'm <laughs> I'm super excited. Well, now that you got a second in a row, do you think the next film you're working on, the uh, taxi film, might make it three for three? Oh, I'm honestly not sure when that will be done. Okay. Uh, we were still working on the thing. Uh, the no film pressure. That, yeah, now nah, the film the film that I'm working on now that most likely will be the next one that's that that will be done as a documentary mm -hmm. but it's also a very nerdy documentary it's not specifically about you know like genre films or, or films but i mean the fabric of the whole thing is so laden with nerd references and it's about it's uh it's it, it's pretty much a story about the american colonialism and and how uh the american government and treated the uh, native population and it's also about hacker spaces and maker spaces and it's also about uh uh kind of like covid so it's a it's it has a, it's a multi-faceted documentary but it's extremely nerdy yeah? mm -hmm. uh and uh i will definitely submit it there i'm not sure it will fit into the program uh I'm pretty sure all the people at Fantastic Fest will enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it the team will enjoy it. I'm, I'm not sure they will book it, you know. <laughs> but uh, but that that's probably the next film. Uh, it's called Hacking at Leaves, mm -hmm. and I think it will be done in January or February next year. You might have to set your sights for South by Southwest then. Just but want to go to Austin. Be, might <laughs> be too late then, mm -hmm. because if I'm if I finish it in February. The, they're already like in what, April or when is South by Southwest? Usually mid late March, but I have yeah. no clue about deadlines. Yeah, I just I'm, watch movies. Then, then, I'm, <laughs> then, I'm, then I'm too late for that, anyways. Yeah, but at the moment I'm just like trying to focus on Rats Nest. And yeah, when I'm going back to Austria, uh, I'll have a couple of more sessions with my editor, and uh, which is very nice that for the documentary. With lots of material and footage, so I'm, I'm working with a really great guy called called Sebastian Schreiner, who is who is doing the editing for the documentary, uh, and I'm just happy that someone is doing the editing because with with Rats and Nest and Masking Threshold, I pretty much did the editing. So with Masking Threshold, my camera guy uh, Florian Hofer uh, helped me a little bit with the with the uh, editing, but I did pretty much like the entire editing for for Rats and Nest myself. And I'm kind of happy that I don't have to edit another one. <laughs> I, I'm very picky and I, I shift around frames all the time and I'm super obsessive about that stuff. And sometimes it's good to let go and, and just like work with someone else on that process. And I enjoy that very much at the moment. Uh, that's uh, the main last questions I had. And I think this has been very informative, both in what you've done and hopefully it will get to release next year as well. Um, so thank you for spending time, uh, away from the robots, uh, to talk about Rosin Nest and life in general. Uh, again, it makes its world premiere this week at Fantastic Fest. It's on their virtual Burnt Ends platform, and I can't wait to see what other walls you break down during your career. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. Let, let's try, let's try to find some walls. Just, just wing it. <laughs> And I, I'm honestly really, really excited uh, to see the first. So today, the first review was published because of all the, you know, like the the the, the press embargo, mm -hmm. and which I honestly don't get. I mean, I get it for the festivals because they want exclusivity and stuff like that. For me, as a filmmaker, it's so weird to have a press embargo, and mm -hmm. and the press release went out like three weeks ago, and I'm still and I was waiting for the PR stuff for people to write reviews. And then he said, no, 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 there's press embargo until the beginning of the festival. And I was like, ah. So so first review just was published. And uh, next day, I hope, I, I hope. I, it's so it's so fun to talk to people and get their perspective on something that I, that I made. Because you do something and you like it a lot and you want to share it with the world. But you have no idea if anyone in the world is actually interested in what you made. And at, I'm at that very exciting point to see what other people think about what I did. And it's, uh, it's exciting. <laughs> so thank you for having me and uh, good luck with, uh, with, with your podcast. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll subscribe it. I'm, I'm, I'm already, I'm already on the, on, on board. <laughs>